idea how this sermon's going to go, but I am so excited about preaching it today. I'm telling you, y'all have no idea. I feel like a racehorse that's just in the gate and ready to fire the thing off, you know, fire the gun and just ready to run. Um, I don't really want to run. I just want to preach, but I feel that excited this, just to run this race with y'all today and to, and to look at these things today that deal with the idea of, of exhortation specifically, of um, our responsibility, God-given responsibility of um, exhortation, preaching, communicating the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I am just so excited. And I just want to say joy to the world. Uh, the Lord has come. Anybody say amen? We have the opportunity to proclaim this joy that Jesus Christ has come into the world, that he has died on the cross and risen from the dead, and that we have life in his name. So few today realize how beautiful and wonderful our Savior is. And our, the, the, great, the great assignment that we have, the great gift we have, is to go out into the world and share this good news. We're continuing a series entitled The Pursuit of Godliness. And what's at stake is our salvation and the salvation of others uh, that's at stake. As 1 Timothy 4.16 says, it's kind of our theme verse for this text, for this series. It says, pay, a cl pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you, if there's been a sermon uh, from this passage of Scripture, from this series, that speaks to the salvation both of ourselves and to those who hear us, it's going to be today. And so just put your seatbelts on. It's going, to be, it's going to be good. And I believe we're going to be edified. We're going to be encouraged today by these things. As we review just for a moment, godliness, first of all, grows uh, in the nourishment of the words of faith and of sound doctrine, godliness grows in us, uh, in those who purposefully discipline themselves to be godly. Thirdly, godliness grows in those who believe how profitable godliness really is. Um, uh, last week we looked at how godliness is the pursuit of those of us who have fixed our hope on the living God. If you didn't hear that message, please go back. It's such an encouraging message about the hope of the living God. Uh, we, we hit this a few weeks ago as we talked about how young believers can be an ex exceptional examples of godliness. So this is our fifth point. It was actually our third point, but it's uh, in review in, in the order of the Scripture. And I've already preached this text in verse 12 as it says, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. And if y'all remember, all the kids were in here that Sunday, the children, and, and everybody was here, and it was such a perfect text to talk about. Don't let anybody look, on, look down on you because you're young. And, and listen, don't let anyone look down on you because uh, uh, of anything. You are the children of God. You've been commissioned by God to be his ambassadors Male, female, young, old, don't let anybody look down on you. Uh, set an example in these ways, as we talked about that a few weeks ago. But I just want to encourage you again. And I believe Paul is encouraging Timothy in this text of Scripture. Look, you know, you know, uh, basically him telling, to, you know that you were, are gifted. You know that God has commissioned you to preach good news. Don't let anybody... Don't let anybody put this fire out in you. You do what God has commissioned you to do. And we're going to get into that heavy, heavy today. And so next we want to look at, let's look, let's look at our text of Scripture. I want to read a few verses, start in verse 9. Look there with me in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We'll pick up with verse 9. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope, we agonize, because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. 
Let no one look down on you for your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. And here we go, verse 13. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Let me just explain verse 14 just for a moment. The, the presbytery, the elders of the church laid their hands on Timothy and commissioned him. This was a, the ordination of Timothy and he was the prophecy for his own heart, for those around him, uh, verifying and, and confirming his call to pastor, to preach uh, the word of God and to go ultimately to Ephesus and be the pastor of this church. They laid their hands on him, they prophesied over him and they, they commissioned him and they sent him out. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. And then verse 16 is our key verse. Pay close attention to yourself, to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do, as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. I just want to say this at the outset. If there's ever been a Sunday for you to surrender to the call of God upon your life as a missionary, as an evangelist, as a pastor, as a teacher, today is that day. If there's ever been a Sunday for some of you, there are young men in, in this church that God is calling you to pastor, to be a pastor of a church, to be a preacher, an evangelist. If there's ever a day for you to surrender to that call, let me just tell you this. You know the call is there. The problem, the only problem is the surrender to that call. To surrender the call means that you sell out, that you just declare before God in your own heart. It doesn't have to be something you parade through here and jump up and down, do some cartwheels up here and say, I'm called to pastor. It's something between you and the Lord. It's something that you just say, okay, God, I'm not going to run anymore. I'm not going to I'm not going to walk away from this. I'm going to run into it with everything that's within me. I'm going to surrender to God's call upon my life. I don't know if y'all remember a young lady who was in our church for many years uh, by the name of Michelle Lewis. I don't know if y'all remember Michelle. I hadn't seen her in a little while. Some dude came along and stole her away from us and took her to uh, be his bride and and to his church, and they've moved and are still serving the Lord and loving the Lord and living for the Lord. They just got married a few weeks ago. But I'm still kind of upset with him stealing uh, Michelle. Y'all, there would be some weeks I would look up here at church, and I would look up over here, and generally in this area, it would be Michelle, and she would have a whole row of young ladies that she had invited to church, had brought to church, that she was leading to the Lord. And I don't know if, I, I think you remember this, Pastor Pete. Pastor Pete was baptizing a lot of these young ladies uh, over the course of months and a year, probably a year's time. Now, I have a conviction in my heart. I believe this. I believe that Michelle Lewis is an evangelist. Um, we got a different idea of an evangelist. We think an evangelist is somebody that dresses up in a shiny pinstripe suit and, and travels around to churches and holds revivals. Now, I guess that might be an evangelist. But where I see biblically an evangelist, a person who goes out into the world and preaches the gospel and shares the gospel and exhorts people and invites them to follow Christ, brings them into the church. And you'll find, when you find an evangelist, you're going to find somebody who's sitting there, but they got a row of people with them that they're leading to Christ, that they're teaching the gospel to. We need more evangelists in our churches. Anybody say Amen. People who believe and know that they are called to go out in this world. Uh, I also believe that, that maybe that call on, and y'all please tell Michelle I bragged on her today because I love that young lady. She is a spirit-filled, godly woman of God. And she knows the gospel. Anybody say amen to that? If y'all know Michelle, you say amen. She knows the gospel. And 
The reality is, is there may even be that call, and I, I know I'm sharing all this about, but, but just as a missionary, a heart of a missionary. Do you realize, friend, you, to be a missionary, you do not have to sign up with a missions organization and travel to some other part of the world to be a missionary. The call to be a missionary is ultimately on all of us to go out into this world and to make Christ known. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Amen, church. And I do believe that there are people, and if there's any ever a day for us to surrender to the call of God on our life to be missionaries, to be evangelists, to be pastors, to be teachers, maybe today is that day. Guys, I, we've been praying, and, and I, I praise the Lord even this morning. So many of you are here early this morning, 8.30, to pray with us and to, to seek the Lord first and to cry out to God and ultimately to say, God, we can't do this. We cannot do this task. God, we need you. God, please help us. And as I looked up this morning, just you know, looked around, I just praise the Lord for you coming in here and praying. And let's, let's just say on the Lord's day, we're starting out just declaring, God, we need you. One of the things that we need so desperately, guys, the altar fires are burning low. And in some places, it's burnt out. They're not people, the people of God are not seeking God in the altars like, like we need to. The altar for me growing up was a place where I would run to when God's conviction was on my heart, when the Spirit of God was drawing my heart in a specific area of my life, that I would run to that altar, get out on my face before God and say, God, I surrender to you. I say, yes, God. I say, yes, God. You've been working in my heart in a specific way, and I say yes to you, God. That's what the altar was for me. Um, and maybe we can make an altar anywhere, at any place, at any time. But the altar fires in a church are where people move out and come before God, get on their knees, humble themselves before God. There's only one thing that keeps us from that altar, and that is our own stinking, rotten pride. And I'll be the first one to say that Brandon's got some of that stinking, rotten pride. I won't say a lot of the time, but some of the time. And some of the time, it's a lot of the time. My own stinking, rotten pride. God, let the altar fires burn at Crossroads Baptist Church with people surrendering to what God is telling them to do. Get us out. Wake us up. Move us, God. You know, I'm going to say this at the outset. There are there are too many people sitting in churches analyzing sermons. Guys, I am not preaching up here today to impress you. I am not preaching to show my intellect or my eloquence or my wisdom. I am preaching today not for you to analyze my sermon. I am preaching today that you and I would analyze our own hearts. Our own hearts. A sermon is not something for us to spectate at. A sermon is something for us to hear and be burdened and to become anxious about our own souls and about our own behaviors and about our own godliness. Amen, church. Who cares what you think and what people think about my sermon and whether they think it was a good sermon or a bad sermon? Oh, that was a good illustration. That made sense. That was good. Oh, wow, that was great. Oh, man, that made me feel so good. I could care less about what people think about my sermon today. What I care about is that somehow, by the grace of God, the Spirit of God would draw our hearts to surrender, to humility, to brokenness, and to desperation for the manifest glory and presence of God to fall on us and to touch our families and to bring us into radical obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If God would come down in this place and shake us, May the wind of God blow through this place and the river of God sweep us away. 
into his assignments, into his agenda for our lives. So much for review. The Bible says here, let's get into it. Number six, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. Look at verse 13 again. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. What did you just do, Pastor Brandon? I just publicly read the Scripture. Amen? You know, there should be a whole lot of Scripture in our churches. We should be constantly reading and exhorting each other in the public reading of Scripture. Let me go on to say, and this is just a short point, um, it is very important to read the Scripture, to read the Bible out loud, publicly, publicly do that in the church, publicly do that wherever we are, whenever we're, wherever we can, wherever possible. Put the Scripture in your term papers. Put your Scripture in the debate at school. Put the Scripture everywhere, anywhere, at every place we possibly can to just publicly read the Bible, to read the Holy Scripture, the Word of God. Somebody say amen. Just read it. You say, listen, I don't know that much about the Bible. Well, how about just read the Bible? Just read it. Write it down. Put it on your forehead. Um, don't put it on your forehead. Put it on your hand. Put it on your arm. Put it, put it on the table. Put it in your phone. Put it somewhere and just read it. Just read it. Just read it. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the manner, succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. Guys, listen, whenever you read the Bible out loud, God will accomplish what he desires through it. Just read it. If there's anything so simple in all of our lives as just opening the Bible and reading it. I, oh, God, help us to be so bold. Amen? In the meeting before you get started in the morning at work, just read the Bible. Just read it. Just read it out loud. You don't have to commentate on it. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to do anything. You just have to read it. You say, I don't know if I can do that. Well, just do it and see what happens. Amen? Pastor Brandon, we all got fired this week. We went to, the, we went to work and started reading the Bible. I just have enough faith to know God will take care of you. Just read it. Every time, every place, anywhere, anytime, any place. Read the scripture out loud as often as you have the opportunity. That's all I got to say about that. Number seven, and I got a lot to say about this. Give attention to exhortation. I want you to look at this verse real quick. Verse 13. Again, it says, until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture to exhortation and teaching. Now, as you study this passage of Scripture, and most scholars believe, as you study, just under, looking at this verse, there, this word exhortation is a unique word, and especially in context to, uh, and in contrast to the word teaching. The word exhortation here. Uh, most believe this is talking about preaching, heralding. This is talking about a witness, an evangelist, a pastor, not just teaching to gain knowledge of doctrine and scripture, but this is someone who's preaching. And guys, there is nothing I love more than preaching, and there's probably nothing I love talking about more than I love talking about preaching. And I just want to say this at the outset. Men and women... Of God, you are called to exhortation, and you are called to preach. To preach? You say, well, pastor, I can't preach. I'm not a pastor. Y'all, we are all preaching something. We are all preaching something. Now, we believe at Crossroads. Listen, you, I'm unashamed, believe that the Bible calls when the church is gathered that men are going to preach in the pulpit here at Crossroads. Okay, men are going to be pastors. We're not going to give a title pastor 
to anything other than spiritually qualified men. But that does not mean that you are not called women. Ladies, look at me. That does not mean that you are not called to preach. The greatest sermons I've ever heard in my life have come from my wife. The greatest sermons. Y'all should hear this woman preach. She preaches to me. She preached to these two boys. I think Caleb and Stephen both would say, my mama can flat out preach, son. My wife is an evangelist. My wife is a missionary. My wife is a preacher of the gospel. She is an exhorter. She is gifted with the gift and the calling of exhortation. Ladies, just because this, this role is, is the responsibility God has given to men to lead, spiritually lead the church, and God has given your husband the spiritual responsibility to be the spiritual leader of your home, doesn't mean that you are not called to preach. I hope that will just free some ladies in here this morning to, to just say, okay, I am going to flat out start preaching. Greatest sermons. I've ever heard have come from my mama. My mama, Brenda Stanley, is a preacher. My dad knows she is a preacher. And when she starts to preach, you better just sit down and shut your mouth. Because she's got something to say. And you better not start arguing because she is going to, she's going to preach. Praise God. For a mama preaching the gospel to me, exhort the gift of exhortation, anointed preaching, anointed witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, praise God. And when we talk about church policy, we talk about church leadership and the positions and places of men and women in the church of fulfilling God-given design roles of God. We're never going to change that, y'all. Listen, look at me. I am never going to change. We are never going to change that because that's what the Bible tells us to do. We're just going to do it the way the Bible tells us to do. But we also want to declare to every man, woman, and child of God in this place, you are called of God to be his witness and to preach, to bring forth the gift of exhortation to everyone around us. What is exhortation? What is exhortation? Exhortation, let's look at the definition. The act of exhortation is in, uh, exhortation, encouragement, comfort, and all scripture actually uh, is, is exhortation. An admonition or encouragement for the purpose of strengthening and establishing the believer in the faith. It is also the encouragement for the purpose of exposing and enlightening the eyes and bringing forth hope and faith in who Jesus is in this world through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus Christ. This is exhortation. All are called to bring this exhortation when we move to the idea of preaching and uh, exhorting and bringing forth a presentation of truth through our lives to believers all around us, all of us are called to do this. We also, listen, we have to, listen, we have to take in context the encouragement of this passage is from the Apostle Paul to Pastor Timothy, and we have to think in context of preaching today in light of that young man, that, that old man in our congregation that is called to pastor and to be admonished to uh, continue in preaching and the gift of exhortation to the church, specifically when the church is gathered. So we're going to talk about pastoral preaching but we're also in light of this we're going to talk about exhortation and preaching to for all men everywhere in the world y'all got the y'all got it so if you're a young man in this room listen there ought to be a place for young men who are here today that have a call of God on their life to preach the gospel and to pastor 
This is going to be a good Sunday for you. This is going to be a good place. There is going to be admonishment, encouragement here. There are going to be some things that I say today that are totally forgotten in, with the idea of pastors preaching and what that means, okay? We're going to talk about that today. So preaching, we have to understand from the text that preaching here, exhortation, is more than teaching. It's more than talking. It's more than walking through curriculum. It's more than delivery of information. It's more than just increasing knowledge. My goal in this, in this uh, arena of preaching this sermon today is not just for the purpose of increasing our knowledge. We are not just here to get smarter today. We are here for God to change us, shape us and mold us, commission us that we might be on his agenda. We might be on mission for him. For his glory. This is not just a talk. <laughs> Have you heard this lately? That, that pastors standing in pulpits, that they even describe what they're doing as a talk. This is not a talk. I'm not here to just talk. I'm not here to just give information. I'm not here to go through curriculum, and I'm especially not here to preach somebody else's sermon that I found on the internet. Talk more about that. Preaching. It's more. What is it then? I'm going to get into something that I think is totally lost, totally lost in modern, even in modern evangelicalism. Totally lost. And it's the idea of anointing, it's the idea of unction. It's the idea of someone standing and preaching with the anointing of God on their life. Preaching with unction. Preaching with power. Not my power, not Brandon's power, not man's power, but the power of the Holy Spirit of God on their life. They're not just bringing information to us. They are preaching under the anointing of the Spirit of God the unction of God that moves mountains, that brings a power upon our life. Because all of us have sat under that kind of preaching. I hope you've sat under that kind of, I hope you're sitting under that kind of preaching where you might say that, you might go home today and say that pastor and you look at your wife, honey, have you been talking to that preacher and telling him all the stuff that's wrong with me? How in the world did he know to talk about that? He's been reading my, what is in the world? That's called the Holy Spirit of God. Has nothing to do with me. Has nothing to do with you. All we did is we got caught up. We got swept up in the river of God. And the Spirit of God was blowing and the Holy Spirit was zeroing in on our hearts. And it cut right into us. That's what I'm talking about with unction. Let's explain it, describe it even further. The idea of anointed preaching, it comes from 1 John 2.20. Just so you understand that I didn't just pull this out of the air this idea of unction and anointing, it says in 1 John 2, 20, it says, but you have an anointing. That In some of your translations, it actually uses the word, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. This word anointing, this word unction is a New Testament word. It's a biblical word. It's something, honestly, that 
uh, I don't know that I've wrapped my head all the way around and that I can completely understand and that I understand how the wind blows and when the wind blows and where it comes from and where it goes. It's that mysterious with the Spirit of God and the anointing of God and the unction of God that that God chooses to do something through... um, exhortation through preaching that cannot be done by any other means and is not done by any other means. It is an anointing. And if I could define unction, if I could find anointing, it is a grace bestowed upon the preacher of exciting the hearts of people toward the worship of God and a pure devotion to God. It is a grace bestowed upon the preacher, exciting the hearts, and that brings about the experiential knowledge of God, the loving of God, the communication of truth in a way that hits our hearts and hits our lives, hits our minds with the the power of God that says there is no other truth but God. There is no other truth but Jesus. There is nothing else in the world that is true but Jesus. And this message from his Bible is true. No matter what anybody else says, it is true. It is not just true for me. It is true for all people, for all times, in all places, and for all of eternity. The scripture, the word of God is living and it is true. And I've just encountered it. I've just experienced it by the grace of God, by the anointing of the spirit of God. It is a divine grace. It is an authority that comes from God. It is a passion and it is a conviction. It's where we sit and listen to a man preach and say, nobody else may believe, but that man believes the Bible. That man believes what he's saying. He believes in what he's doing and he believes that in what we should be doing. And there comes in that moment, y'all, and I hate to use the word anxiety. I don't know what, else, what other word to use, but it causes anxiety. It causes us to come to a place where we experience conviction in a way that says, uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I'm in a mess. I got, something's got to change. Oh, God. Oh God, help. Oh God, you got to do something. Oh God, this is wrong. I'm headed in the wrong way. I'm headed in the wrong direction. Oh God, help me. Y'all know that kind of anxiety? I remember one night at a church meeting, a man preached and I was, before he got done, I was on the floor, on my knees, crying out to God, my You know where you cry out in your guts? You feel like your guts are coming out of your head? Oh, God, help me. (laughs) That is where we've encountered the Spirit of God. That is what a preacher can't do without the Spirit of God, without anointing, without the unction, without the grace of God, through what we're doing here, to preaching the Word of God. We cannot manufacture, we cannot produce this in the flesh. There aren't enough books on the bookshelf. There aren't uh, aren't enough seminary classes. There aren't enough conferences to go to. There aren't enough church growth events to go to to get us to that place. There's There's nothing ultimately that man can do to accomplish this place where we feel like heaven and earth has just moved And God has just cut me to the heart. Cut me to the heart. Oh God, let me experience this every day, amen? Oh God, let us never go a Sunday at Crossroads where someone is not standing in this pulpit with the anointing of God and the unction of God upon their life. Amen? To cut through the darkness. How do we get unction? How do we get that? Young preachers, listen to me. I don't know if I'm speaking to any young preachers. I don't know. 
Some of you have said, I, you know, I may be called to preach. I may be called to pastor. There's no maybe. There's no maybe. Either he has or he hasn't. And if he has, I mean, unless you want to be like Jonah and find yourself in the belly of a fish, you better get on with it. We need unction, don't we? We need authority. We need God to speak clearly, plainly, profoundly, perfectly through his word to our hearts so that we know what to do. Any of you here today say, if I just knew what to do, Pastor, if I just knew what to do, if you could just tell me, I can't tell you what to do. The word of God. The word of God, the wisdom of God. But it is, gets personal, doesn't it? What am I supposed to do? What am I? What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? What is the gift of God that I need to fan into flame? Leonard Ravenhill. Let me just say this. Prayer brings an unction in preaching that is like a fire hearts that are like grass set ablaze by God's word. That's what unction does. It just sets, it sets our hearts on fire. Anybody here this morning just say, oh God, do that. Set my heart on fire. I'm not gonna, I don't want to waste my life trying to get stuff. Amen. Leonard Ravenhill says this. I'll read this little section. It's a chapter in his book titled Why Revival Tarries. I don't agree with all of old Leonard's uh, theology, but I do agree with his ideas on this. He's dead now, so I can talk bad about him, I guess. He says, in all you're getting, get unction. One does not need to be spiritual to preach. That is to make and deliver sermons of homiletical perfection and exegetical exactitude. I'm going to read that again. One does not need to be spiritual to be a preacher of our modern era. And I can very easily preach homiletically homiletical perfection, perfect homiletical sermons and exegetical exactitude. But a combination, by a combination of memory, knowledge, ambition, personality, plus well-lined bookshelves, self-confidence, and a sense of having arrived, the pulpit is yours almost anywhere these days. Preaching of the type mentioned affects men, Prayer affects God. Preaching affects time. Prayer affects eternity. The pulpit can be a shop window to display our talents. The closet speaks death to display. Let me just stop and say this. And I feel, I feel bad about this on Mondays. Usually I feel like a heel or a goat. I don't feel like a hero. Pastors talk terrible about Mondays. Mondays are terrible for pastors because you second guess everything that you said. And let me just say, Finna, if I look like a fool up here, then let me be a fool for Christ. Death to display. That is not what preaching is about. Death to the exaltation of man. Put me to death. Crucify us. Amen, church. The tragedy, he says, of this last hour is that we have too many dead men in the pulpits giving too many dead sermons to too many dead people. 
There's a strange thing that I've seen. This is probably in the 1960s and 70s when he's saying this. There's a strange thing that I've seen even in the fundamentalist circles. It is preaching without unction. The ugly fact is that the altar fires are either out or burning very low. The prayer meeting is dead or dying. By our attitude to prayer, we tell God that what has begun in the spirit, we can finish in the flesh. Wow. Don't we declare this church by our prayerlessness? But our inability to seek God's holy face in prayer, do we not say to God, God, we know you started this in the spirit, but we're going to finish it ourselves. We're going to finish this in the flesh. We're going to finish this with our Baptist bookstore curriculum. It's what I've been told my whole life. If you want to have a church on fire, go to Lifeway Christian Bookstores and make sure you do as many Bible studies as you can, as many Bethmore Bible studies as you can do, and your church will be on fire. That's what we need. That's what we need is more curriculum. Amen. That's what we need. We're going to finish in the flesh. What we need is a move of God What we need is the power of God. What we need to experience is the unction and the anointing upon all of us who are preaching to each other the gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching to our kids, preaching to our grandkids. The gift of exhortation with the anointing of God upon our life. Amen. Homeschool mama, you need the unction of God, the anointing of God upon your life to preach good news. Amen. The nurses and the doctors and the lawyers and the salesmen and the managers and the whatever, you know, whatever you do, we need the unction of God, the anointing of God for the gift of exhortation, the preaching of the word of God. Not just here, but all of us needing this grace upon our life. The greatest way we finish in the flesh is through our prayerlessness. Modern pastors who have lost their thirst for unction, their thirst for anointing, Modern pastors today who don't even know or believe there is such a thing as unction or anointing. They don't even know about this. They've never heard about this. Never heard about it. Never heard about it. You may be looking at me as, and you just say, Pastor, is this unction, anointing, is this the whole, the whole crazy thing about you? This is just me. Okay, this is just me. I'm not going to try to be any, anybody else. But guys, you don't need my personality. You don't need... It's not about, it's not even necessarily passion or emotion, guys. It is, it is a grace. It is the anointing of God, the unction of God that brings forth the power of God. The person that is hearing the preacher is moved and affected. They're no longer analyzing the preacher. They're analyzing their hearts. Do I believe what this person is saying? it's when you listen to someone who's preaching under the anointing of the Holy Spirit the unction of God takes what they're saying and it presses it into our hearts And it's not even something, listen, with all of our might, with all of our power that we 
can even resist sometimes. Because that anointing, that power, God accomplishes. Amen. Through his word, he accomplishes what he wants to do in that moment with his word. And we are a recipient of that. We didn't control it. We didn't even open up to it. It just got pressed into our lives. Oh, and if that is happening right now, if that happens next week, next month, next year, if that happens Wednesday night, when Mike is preaching, wherever, whenever it happens, that's the time to run to the altar. That's the time to get on our face before God and say, God, thank you for your grace of pressing your word into my heart. They don't even know. They don't even know there's such a thing. Young preacher, you're going to know. Because Pastor Brandon just told you, you're going to know. There's an anointing. Young evangelist, young missionary, young mom, young dad. Praise the Lord for all these wonderful babies at our church. Somebody say amen, Grandpa and Grandma. All these little precious lives, these little babies. Stephanie's uh, kept the nursery a couple times so late, coming back. You ought to meet so and so. Their little baby is so cute. It's amazing, isn't it? Be- isn't it marvelous that God's bringing these little babies and these children? Last week, the whole preschool hallway, y'all, was full of kids, full of kids. And anointed mamas and daddies preaching, exhorting day after day after day. And God's anointing on their life, pressing the word of God into their lives. It's transformational. Just to swing to the negative just for a moment, the values of modern preachers of our day And I would say of our modern era, I would say for a long, long time, since the Enlightenment age, oh, aren't we glad we've been enlightened? It's a bunch of hogwash is what it is. I don't even know what that word means, but it is. The enlightenment of man. First is intellectualism. I believe modern evangelicalism, modern Protestantism, modern day preaching very much leaning on intellectualism and that is because we've moved into a mode where men are not analyzing their hearts they're analyzing sermons and the more intellectual we sound the better everybody walks with, oh was it that good is it, boy yeah, it all fit together always oh, so good good preaching i don't know why i've always hated that and i know y'all you can I'm, nobody's ever going to congrat. Nobody's ever going to cut. Good, good. Pat. I could care less about that. You know, the greatest compliment you can give a pastor is don't congratulate him on his sermon. It's come to the pastor and say, God really dealt with me in some area of my life today. God pressed his truth into my heart today. Who cares what people think about Brandon's sermons? Intellectualism. Second, second area of value today is philosophy. Uh, we've become men of the cloth that become philosophers. It's all about um, logic. Well, that's logical. That's a logical conclusion. And that's a logical solution. Especially in a land that is completely illogical, it's good to hear something logical every now and then. Somebody say Amen. Because it is logical. The Bible's logical. The principles of the Bible are logical. Praise God, we're somewhere that's logical. This is not our value. Our value is not hearing something logical. Our value is the Spirit of God dealt with me today, dealt with my heart, dealt with my pride, dealt with my holiness, dealt with my godliness, dealt with my life, dealt with my heart. can pride ourselves on being philosophical, being logical. Thirdly, 
probably more so in progression of our modern day today, we become more psychological. We've gone intellectual, then we go to philosophy, we go to logic, then we go to psychology. Let's solve everybody's problem with modern psycho psychological stuff. I want to teach you how to better your life, and I'm just going to take the latest, greatest psychology of our day, and we're all going to live a happier life. Look at me just for a second. Do you realize that it is not necessarily God's will for you to be happy right this second? Look at me. <laughs> this life is not about yours and my happiness. Let me just tell you, listen, if I'm living in gross or immorality, should I be happy today? And this is what we do with psychology. We bring immoral people into our churches and make them happy about it. That is not right. It, listen, look at me, look at me. You're gonna be anxious sometimes. You're going to have anxiety. Anxiety for us. I am not a psychologist. I just want y'all to listen to me. When you touch a stove, I learned very, very early on, when you touch a hot stove, it hurts. And you probably won't touch it too many more times in your life, although I have touched a hot stove way too many times. You would think I would learn. Anxiety in our life, in a lot of ways, anxiety in our life is the feeling of pain over problems, pain in our life over stuff that ain't right. Sometimes it's because of stuff that ain't right in the world, some of the stuff ain't right in other people, some of the stuff ain't right in a world system that is demonic. Some of the anxiety comes because we are grieved, we are mourning over our sin, over the sin in our church, over our prayerlessness. Guys, do you realize sometimes God's word wants to come and cause us grief, cause us to mourn over things that need to change? So much of the time, we are looking for some way of escape from the pain of our life. And that in all actuality, God has brought pain. I'm getting psychological here. God has brought pain into our life because he is molding us and shaping us. And he's also bringing us to bring in perfect, complete dependence on him, which is what all of life is about. But psychology is all about trying to get us out of it and try to find a solution for it when God is wanting to bring us into it sometimes, to test us sometimes, to try us sometimes, not to tempt us, but to try us sometimes with a fire to purify our lives. Let me tell you where it's gone, and I got to close. Oh my gosh, look at the time. I got a lot more, so much good, so much good stuff that I was so excited about preaching, but I got so foolish, so foolish. These are the things I said on money and go, what in the world, goofball? Intellectualism, philosophy, psychology. Let me tell you where it's gone next. It's just flat out wicked counsel. Wicked, wicked counsel coming straight out of the mouth of clergy. Wickedness. Evil counsel. Because we just want everybody to be happy. If they come to church and feel some anxiety, feel some conviction, feel some pain, they're not going to come back pastor you could tell somebody this week our pastor believes that no pain no gain <laughs> it does hurt a little bit sometimes doesn't it it's just wicked counsel 
it's just affirming, it's affirming people in their sin. It's affirming them in their lifestyle that is in total rebellion against God. Just because, just because we want their money. We want their money. And it's wicked. <clears throat> I put myself in that group. Shame on us for the manipulation, even going so far as to firm people in their sin just to, just to appease them with wicked counsel. Then it moves to the next category, I would say is even scoffery and mockery of the Bible, of the things of God, of who God is what he's declared himself to be, and especially mockery of the Bible itself. Scoffing at it, mocking it. Why would a pastor take shots at the Bible? I want you to listen. Whenever a pastor's talking about the Bible, he's talking about the creation myth or talking about some other uh, rejection of supernatural creation, rejection of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, rejection of the, 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 uh, the law of God, the absolute truth of God, the absolute uh, morality of Scripture, whatever he's, whatever he's shooting at, you just ask yourself the question, why would that man scoff at and make a mockery of the Bible, the holy word of God? Why would he do that? It is absolute wickedness. And his scoffery. And just in closing, Psalm 1, 1 through 6, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And Whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they will be like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of righteous. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of God. This is what's happening in the end. This is what's happening with us, men of God, women of God, exhorters of the word of God, preachers in this place. You are the ones that God is going to anoint. You are the ones that God is gonna bring an unction upon you to preach good news, to press the truth into the hearts and lives of people. And the wind's gonna blow. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes but it changes things. You all thought y'all was sitting in the back to get away from me, but I'm coming back here to you. You are, you are the preachers. You are the evangelists. You are the missionaries. You are the anointed ones. You are the lights in this world. You are the stars shining like the stars in the universe. You are God's people. We're all gonna be with family these next few weeks. Oh, do we need anointed messengers preaching with unction at the family party. Amen, church? I want to preach as enthusiastically and as passionately and as anointed at the family party as I do in the pulpit. Those people I love more than anything in this world, my aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews and people that I love, people that I love. It's not easy. It's not easy when they don't love you and they might not love what you're saying. They might think that you are a crazy lunatic, countercultural. There's three decisions we have. We can isolate ourselves, we can insulate ourselves, or we can infiltrate the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The temptation is to isolate, isn't it? 
man, I'm just going to get away from those people that don't like me anyway. Just not going to go to the parties anymore. I'm just going to, you know, do my thing. I'm going to get away. Let's move further out to the country. You ever thought that's not maybe God's idea for you to move further out, to get away from people? That God actually wants you to infiltrate this world with the light and the gospel of Jesus Christ to be salt and to be light and to be the anointed messengers and exhorters of God's word to the world. Be courageous, church. Be courageous. Be willing to be a witness. Shine your light. It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what they think. What matters is what he has called us to do. Be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Let's pray. Father.